In comparison to other soft tissues, it becomes so they're essentially deeply embedded within the bone minerals. So typical imaging techniques, you just cannot use them in a hidden way. And we'd be really interested to understand what the role of blood vessels play in degenerative bone loss and processes such as mm -hmm. fracture repair. So it's imagine a little bit of that work very closely with engineers and we've developed high resolution imaging techniques to allow us to better visualise the vascular turf within bone. And we can use lots of different models for this, models of ageing, models of disease, to see how they, they might be involved in that. So these are the initial discussions I was having with Louise. I was talking about these bone scans that we do showing from in-person videos. And so this is a tibia, and so this would be the knee, and this would be the foot, this is a mouse foot. Public engagement activity, we don't generally talk about that. And so, this is a, a low resolution scan of the bonus. We've got to look in more detail into a particular region within it. This is a high resolution CT, so this goes down to really sub micron level. And you can see that bone is really, really, there's a really um, intricate kind of arrangement of blood vessel canals within it, which are represented here in red. Um, and also, the cells are um, in there too. And their spatial and organisation around the blood vessels is really interesting to us as to their size and how they communicate with the blood vessels as well. So these are basically the initial kind of conversations that I had with Louise around the technology that we use to look at the bone microstructure and what it means in terms of bone health and disease. Uh, so these are some typical uh, scans from our lab just to demonstrate the role of all the blood vessels in the disease. So this is a healthy, oh, this is a healthy um, bone essentially on the left. Um, and it's a disease bone on the right, and you can see just mo how much more vascularised the, um, the disease bone actually is. It's quite profound. And as well as these kind of differences like the disease, as I mentioned, we're also interested in the sex differences as well and linking that to health um, inequalities. So I've just got a, hopefully a little catch of the balloon now. How did this collaboration come about? It all came about through lockdown, through a residency that paired artists and scientists together and collaborated around finding a way to explain science through and with art. For this, we first came up with a question. How do we engage people with a complex and unseen elements in bone? It started with a question, but it happened through making. One of the things I was really interested in is how you can simply explain an idea through an act of making. And for me, the idea that bone wasn't just this white object that we all think of it as, but a complex layered piece of structure that is affected by our lives and our environments was something really exciting to play with. I created work around it and then I came to thinking about how would I explain this to somebody else without words? How would I explain that if you carved in, if you cut up, if you examined a bone, it would change every single slice that you looked at it under the microscope? And the idea of the bone crayon came through this, a layered crayon. Each one is different. They all look similar on the outside, but by investigating them through different ways, they some suddenly transform into this object that starts to make you curious to think about why it's changing and what may have made these changes inside the crayon. So it's one thing to make something exciting and beautiful in your studio. It's quite another to see an inaction used by other people. We wanted to make the instructions as open and simple as possible, but with as wide a exploratory experience. So we came up with a graphic image allowing for all levels of English and understanding and also age to explore the bone crayon. We presented it in a box with objects which are similar to things you find in the lab, like petri dishes um, and uh, small tubes to gather up what was left after you had drawn with it. And it was amazing to find out what people knew about bone, how they thought about it differently after using the bone crayon 
and using it as a tool to have conversations. And I think that's what's the most exciting thing. It opens up conversations with people to explore what is a complex question. reveal the layers that are underneath. Typically we just give it to people so um, see what they kind of do with it. It depends on your audience essentially who you're working with. You go to a uh, classroom, the little seven year olds, they'll just smash them. Which is absolutely fine. And then they take all the little bits and we bring lots of big laboratory consumables as Lou was mentioning, um, like this, and they can put the kind of ribbon into the bone crayon into these kind of um, and which is all good, or people can just start um, drawing with them as well. So quite often we'll have really large pieces of paper on the floor and um, people can start drawing. It takes a while to get through the layer of the, um, the black and black. It takes quite a while before the colours start to come in. Um, and then you can get some really beautiful kind of artworks for you to use as well. So, um, at the end of that art and science on a postcard, um, project, we had a prototype essentially of Road Free and a really nice idea. And Louise produced a really beautiful uh, postcard, and I kind of produced a like flower on a postcard. Oh, it was a really successful project. So that, that's where we were at the end of the kind of prototype, something cool, but also a really, really um, good collaborative relationship. So me and Louis, like any collaboration has actually worked, we just got on really well and had a lot of fun, so that's how we can continue to it. So still sort of not quite back to the normal working condition of the university, we still partly closed. And we were kind of thinking about what next with this, what can we do? So the university has some higher education and innovation funding um, available. And my next door neighbour at the time, um, basically, um, she was our impact um, manager in our faculty, and she said, Claire, apply for some money, we'll give you it. Um, and so we did. And she said, Claire, congratulations, you've got the money, and by the way, you're sending out to hands on humanity, humanity, it's um, And this is a kind of festival run by the uh, university. It's really easy, actually, you literally just have to turn up your, with your activity. Here we are, here we collaborate with Patricia Goldman, who works with the uh, biomedical imaging unit. Going into this, to be honest, we didn't really have much of a plan. We had tools to talk about own health, we didn't really have a specific question in mind. Um, but what was important to us really was um, that it was going to be a kind of reflective experience, allowing you know, that dialogue to, uh, to get started today, allow us to go in and talk about own health um, should we want to. So it was a fairly successful um, first housing, I think, and we learned a lot from it. Um, so in terms of understanding um, our science collaborations and activities and how they might work, it's important, I think, to be aware of what your limitations are. So quite often we get invited to do the bone crayon, and our limitation actually is um, how many crayons we have. And so we've been invited to do it in a lecture theatre of 500 people, that's not going to work. We're going to give it a little bit of crayons, no one's really going to listen to me, probably in that kind of environment. We're not going to get much of a dialogue, I'm not going to get anything back from them. Um, and so we don't tend to do that. So the last couple of years, I think, we've become much more refined in the sort of setting that really works for this exercise. Um, and workshops are really, really good. So kind of about 45, one hour, and um, workshops is enough time to get people in, get them comfortable in the space, and um, get them creating some artworks, um, and hopefully chatting to them at home as well. And festivals are good as well, it's often not too big, but we're going to Pride this year, which is really nice, it allows us to talk about 
in conversations about transgender and food, which is really good. So where are we today? So we're sort of two, three years on. We've done lots. Of, sorry, we've done, we've done, we've done lots of um, university festivals, which have been really great. Um, Stop set, which is a science one, and then hands on humanities. Going into local communities. This is a kind of scene that's been run from Common Engagement Research Unit at the University and um, Community Takeover, which has been really fantastic. Um, What's been really interesting to me is now that these kind of public engagement activities are now becoming really integral to our research um, and our research hypotheses that we're generating in our labs and as all the sort of conversations that we're having. So we have interests, as I mentioned, in sex differences in bone and health inequalities, and we're able to have conversations with people in local communities about that and how those health inequalities are impacting their lives. And then we can take that back to the lab and start adjusting our experiments around looking at sex studies and how they might improve these health inequalities as well. Final thing is just what we're up to next, which is the studio lab. Where to next? The Bone Cream was an amazing project and still is an ongoing project that is further developing the more that I work with it and the more that I work with people around it. But we felt there was more to be gained from this collaboration. So through conversation, through discussion, through acknowledging two experienced females in their fields, we came up with the Studio Lab. The Studio Lab is a movable space that can be an art gallery for drawings connected into experiments. It can be a space to measure questions that we might put up. It can be a space to investigate. It can be a space which is creative and also engages different ages, different genders in exploring the why, the questions that we have, what might the answers and evidence that we create in this space do. We're working with a designer, Billy Angel, a furniture designer, and we are creating a flexible, engaging art and science space, which is movable and is changeable. And it will look good. It will have a wide target market and appeal, and it will function on multiple levels. And it is to engage everybody. So it has to be something that doesn't look too childish, doesn't look too adult, it has that ability to be a space which a studio is and which a laboratory is to look, to investigate, to question, to enjoy exploring. It's been a pleasure introducing you to some of the ideas and thoughts that we have during this project and I'd be very happy if there's any questions to answer some more by email